Hello and welcome back to the KCC channel. I hope you're having a wonderful day. I'm Rob and I'll be reading you a couple of stories from the Malicious Compliance subreddit. Before we do that, please hit that subscribe button and click the notification bell. It's free and you can always reverse it later. Our first story today was posted by N11Ordo, the not so friendly local gaming store. Let's jump right in. This might be a long one, so let me set the stage before I get to the good part. Actors, me, Dan, the stressed but good manager, at the time juggling kids, education, and store management, usually needed 30 hours per day to do all the things he promised he'd do. Oz, the store owner, a massive know-it-all. Background. At the time when this happened, I had been unemployed several years. So when the job center gave the go-ahead for the chance at a government-paid intern spot at the local gaming store, I jumped on it with gusto with the hopes of one day working full-time with my hobby. Act 1, First Contact. Monday morning and I was giddy as can be when I locked up my bike next to the gaming store, head already filled with ideas about how this was the start of a long and glorious career working with my beloved hobby. Oz quickly greets me, dumps over onboarding responsibility to Dan, and then promptly rushes out to catch a flight to a big board game convention in Germany. After a slightly confused welcome aboard spiel from Dan, he introduces me to the back area consisting of storage, a small office, and an even smaller kitchen. After the five cent tour, Dan finds out that the store is out of intern shirts and the store owner hasn't put them on back order, so I'm given a company branded work shirt with a temporary handwritten badge that says intern, pinned to the front pocket as a stopgap solution, and told what's expected of me. This includes sweeping and dusting the store every morning, restock the shelves, assist customers, and if all those have been checked off, paint the store's supply of loner wargaming terrain. This will be important later on. Act 2. The Troubles Begin. One week later. What do you think you are doing? That area is employees only. I look up from behind the counter where I've been helping Dan tally boxes of 100 plus mixed dice to see Oz march up to the counter finger pointing square at me and looking like I just killed his pet hamster in front of him. I'm helping the manager tally these dice. So he, I said employees only, you are not an employee. Okay, okay. Hey Dan, can I take these boxes over to the Magic the Gathering table and tally them there? Sure. No, you cannot. Those dice are to be kept behind the counter at all times. Not wanting to make a fuss and maybe ruin my hopes of working with my hobby, I put the dice boxes back in order and stepped out from behind the counter. How about I restock the shelves with the new games we have in the back room? The back room is employees only as well. You can't be in there without supervision. I'm guessing you don't have time to supervise me while I get the things I need. No, I don't. I'm meeting the guy setting up the web store, so I have better things to do than watch you haul boxes around. Dejected, I pick up a broom and decide to sweep the floor for the fifth time that day. The web store was, according to a conversation between Oz and Dan I overheard, going to be the come-all, end-all solution that would multiply the amount of customers for the store in no time flat. Oz had hired a guy part-time to set it up recently, so I scratched his behavior up to stress and moved on with my day. Fast forward three days. You can't wear that. Those shirts are for employees only. Go change right this instant. I looked up from scrubbing off a stubborn coffee ring from one of the tables reserved for the upcoming Magic the Gathering tournament later that day and noticed that Oz was pointing at me and fuming with barely concealed anger. I was told by Dan to wear this so customers know I'm an intern. I don't care. Those shirts are for employees only and you are not an employee. Go change. One quick shirt change later, I am now using my regular short sleeve summer shirt with no sign or branding to differentiate me from generic customer. Act 3, The End. I've gotten a lot of complaints about you from customers lately. They say you aren't professional enough. I don't want you to handle customer service anymore. For the record, this is complete BS. I know somewhere around 80% of all the people that shop at the gaming store from a local wargaming club, and no one has said anything to me about my behavior at the store, either during or after this. Okay, so what do you want me to do instead? 
I don't know. Find something to do. You know what's expected of you. Let's see. Stores cleaned and dusted, floors swept, can't restock shelves, can't handle customer service, can't loiter behind the counter to learn the register. What else is there? Oh, right. Painting terrain. Here's where the malicious compliance comes into play. I grab some boxes of dull, sprue gray terrain pieces and the big box of paint pots and sprays. Usually, it would take about 45-ish minutes to paint each piece to what is referred to as tabletop standard. A few quick coats of paint, a slather of wash to get depth, and a quick dry brushing to pop what details there are, but this won't do at all. This store needs to have the best painted terrain it can possibly have. Paints are prepared, reference photos researched at great length, and every minuscule piece of mold line scoured away like it is an affront to nature itself. Now, just the prep work for each piece runs up to 40 minutes without even the first layer of paint having been applied yet. I carefully thin each layer of paint to nearly the consistency of pure water and apply each layer with utmost care before letting each piece dry for 20 minutes before applying the next layer of ultra-thinned paint. Every single detail on the terrain pieces are given the full competition winner treatment. This goes on for a week, customers or no customers. My days now consist of sweeping and dusting the store, then bringing out the big box of terrain and paints. Paint two or three terrain pieces for seven hours, then clock out and go home. All the while, Dan is overworked to the point of near nervous breakdown, and Oz is ranting about customers being neglected and that nothing is getting done without him. Fast forward a day or so, and by lunchtime, I have just finished up a statue terrain piece that now looks like it could step off the board by itself. That won't do. Redo that statue. Um, why? It doesn't match the style of the other pieces. You never said anything about what quality you wanted the terrain pieces painted in, so I figured I'd do my best. I don't care. Either redo it to match the rest or get out. This is new. Oz hasn't complained about any of the other pieces that I painted in the same style. Well, enough is enough. Instead of my usual grin and Barrett stoicism, I get up, carefully put the paint pots back in order, and start putting away the terrain pieces. What are you doing? Putting back everything where it should be? I told you to repaint the statue, not put everything back. You told me to redo it or get out. I'm doing that. I quit. Fast forward to current day. Dan has quit working at the gaming store. The web store is a broken piece of crap that only barely does the minimum required. And the physical store was limping along on life support even before the pandemic hit. From what I heard from Dan last time I spoke to him, a lot of wargamers stopped coming to the store to play because they thought the majority of the old terrain pieces looked like crap and figured they could do better themselves by pooling resources and setting up a gaming club. I think things honestly worked out for the better. I think Oz was looking more for a slave than an employee, and I seriously doubt you would have been hired by him. If so, you wouldn't have been paid very well, and you wouldn't have liked working there. Our next story today was posted by Rando Boomer. Company requires using our airline miles for work trips? Let's jump right in. Another fun story of an obnoxious boss. As I've mentioned in other posts, I used to travel a lot for business, between 30 and 35 weeks a year. Our boss was a frequent traveler as well and taught us the tricks of the trade for accumulating frequent flyer miles and especially status, a really great perk. Eventually, he retired and sold the company to New Boss. New Boss overheard that I had over 500,000 frequent flyer miles with my airline, not credit card points, and said he should implement a new policy that we had to use our personal frequent flyer miles for our business travel since the company had paid for our trips. That weekend, my wife and I sat down and booked weekend trips all over the country over the next year. Boston for clam chowder? Check. New York City for a Broadway show? Check. Garlic Fest in Gilroy, California? A real and delicious thing, by the way? Check. And Monday morning, my airline frequent flyer mile account was down to about 15,000 miles. Later that week, it was time to book a trip, and he said I had to use frequent flyer miles. I brought up my account and showed him I didn't have enough miles. He asked where they went, and when I said I had booked some trips, 
he demanded I redeposit the miles. I pointed out there was a $150 charge per person and that since it wasn't policy, I wasn't going to pay it. Pissed, he announced going forward, we need approval for personal use of our personal frequent flyer miles. Okay boss, you bet. My next step was to spread my flights over any and every airline I could find to prevent accumulating the 20,000 miles required to redeem for a free ticket. I was on United, Frontier, American, Delta, Northwest, Continental, US Air, Southwest, etc. At one point, I think I booked a trip on the Mrs. Grace L. Ferguson Airline and Storm Door Company. Google it. It's a Bob Newhart routine and more true now than when he performed it 60 years ago. He eventually figured out what I was up to, and he lost what little patience remained for me. Then the following, paraphrased, took place. I suppose you think you're a smart guy? No, I know I'm a smart guy. Don't get cute. No, I'm smart. Cute is just a bonus. Look, I see my wife about 10 days a month. I live out of a suitcase. I know the aircraft evacuation speech by heart. Most of my meals are handed to me through a window, and thanks to my willingness to do this, you make hundreds of thousands of dollars. Can you please just let me keep the only perk I get from all this? Boss thought about it for a bit, grunted, fine, keep your miles, and walked away. OP mentioned in the comments that the boss wanted him to use his frequent flyer miles because he was trying to minimize cash outlays to cover for his embezzling which he used on everything from season tickets to breast implants for his wife. OP says that the favorite part of the boss getting caught was when OP anonymously filed a 3949A to the IRS for tax fraud, because the IRS doesn't care if you embezzle as long as you pay taxes on what you embezzle. Apparently, the boss lost his house, season tickets, everything. He ended up divorced, so he doesn't even get to enjoy the breast implants either. <laughs> Our next story also was posted by Rando Boomer. No keeping per diem money, no receipts, equals no reimbursement. Let's jump right in. I was reminded of this when posting in another thread. A couple decades ago, I traveled a lot for business, between 30 and 35 weeks a year. Initially, I looked forward to the romance of travel, only to discover it was endless awakenings, feeling like the Rohypnol had just started to wear off. But I digress. I had a really great boss who gave us a standard meals per diem. I think it was $30 per day. This worked great for me. I'd grab the complimentary continental breakfast in the lobby, typically be too busy to eat lunch, and grab something from Subway on the way back to the hotel. Not the healthiest way to live, but it added up to an extra $100 per week. Eventually, he sells the company to a new boss. I return from a trip and submit my per diem request. He denies it, and since I didn't keep the receipts, I had to pay for all my own meals on that trip. I explained the previous arrangement and asked if we could do it that way. He tells me, no, if you don't have a receipt, you don't get reimbursed. He drafted and printed the policy. Three meals a day, no more than a 15% tip, no room service, no snacks, no desserts, no alcohol. Okay, have it your way. My next trip was to the Bay Area of California, which was insanely overpriced then too. I decided I would follow the new policy to the letter. We all know that breakfast is the most important meal of the day, so steak and eggs is the smart way to start the day in the nearby four-star hotel. Realizing I wasn't getting enough steak and lobster in my diet, I went for the surf and turf special for dinner. And since I wouldn't have time for lunch the next day, another to go please, kind sir. It was a glorious week of finding the most expensive things I could both A. Pronounce and B. Eat. I returned to the office and submitted my expenses, with receipts of course. Instead of $150 that week, the company wrote me a check for over $700. The new boss quickly rescinded that policy, allowing me my $30 per DM again, and I could keep what I didn't use. OP mentioned in the comments again, the new boss was a real piece of work, and I was gone within a couple years. One event I remember was a really bad hotel stay. The staff was very nice and apologetic and offered to refund the night. To my way of thinking, why should my boss save money at my discomfort? So I asked them, and they gave me a voucher 
which I was able to use elsewhere in the chain. We used it for a free night for the family later that summer. Ah, the glory of endless travel for work, waking up and not knowing what city you're in, eating high-fat, high-calorie meals, airports, and arguing over per diems. Thank you to both OPs for posting their stories in the Malicious Compliance subreddit. They are linked in the description down below. Please go check them out. Check out the Karma Comment Chameleon podcast available on all major podcasting platforms. Just search for Karma Comment Chameleon. Thank you for watching. Check out one of these other videos. And if you haven't yet, please hit that subscribe button for more daily Reddit stories.